see I have another guest there. Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> Who's been here all day. Uh, Amy, uh, Amy Reese. And a uh, um, couple things I wanted to do. I just wanted to show you. I said we had the Who's Woods uh, Kestrel uh, poster that we partnered with. So let's see. Um, we had the Wisconsin Society of Ornithology, the George Mich Mich Sutton uh, Research, Raptor Resource Project, uh, SOAR, uh, we had the North American Falconers Association, the Wisconsin Falconry Association, and We Energies Foundation, all chipped in to make these posters a really nice, informative poster about the American Kestrel talking about the life cycle, and then uh, the neat thing that's on the back here that I mentioned, um, we're working with a couple different scout groups where there's actually a nice plan here to build a Kestrel nest box, and it shows a suggested mounting dimensions and pole configuration here. So uh, this is something that we have available. I think what we have, how many of these? Oh gosh, I think we have 500. So if you're a teacher, uh, the woodshop teachers especially, if you're a Boy Scout group, a community organization, if this is something that you would be interested in, it does take some dedication and time, but if you're interested in it, please get a hold of us. Uh, you can go to our website at raptorresource.org, look down at the bottom, you'll see an email address, just email us and let us know. And also a special shout out to the RoboCats First Lego League, from Wacon, looking forward to seeing your project. All right, and I think I was mentioning about some interesting research that's coming out. Uh, Chris McClure, uh, who we met out at the uh, World Center for Birds of Prey earlier this year, uh, he and another group of researchers have come up with some interesting uh, uh, initial research that I think we'll probably post out there for folks to take a look on, on the Raptor. Uh, resource uh, project Facebook page so and website so wanted to show you that and then so let's talk about this eagle egg um, so I have to tell you that I, I can I got to keep pinching myself of how much fun that was uh, to go up in the nest with PK and uh, we did catch it on video Iowa Public Television uh, Andrew Bat and his crew did uh, catch we had a GoPro up there, so we were taking video, as I keep mentioning here, over the last year, Iowa Public Television has been working with us, they've been collecting video uh, of what we do, so someday here we'll probably have some neat footage to show you guys. Uh, but So going up into the nest, uh, um, initially thought, uh, wow, I pulled this, remember that big weed that was growing in the nest? Pulled the weed up and there was at least about four to five inches of material on the roots there that came up over that whole area. So I was breaking through that. It's like, oh, no egg, no egg, no egg. What's Maybe it just disappeared. <laughs> Maybe the mice got it. Maybe, you know, it just broke down or whatever. And then I just thought, remembered how deep that S cup was. So I went down another four or five inches and started pulling things to the side and, and right away there it was. So. Um, we also have video and some better photos of the, the egg after we retrieved it and some video of the whole process that, that uh, my public television has. So I can't share that with you right now. But So what did we do with it? We packaged it up carefully. We got it down to Iowa State University and apologized for the delay. Um, everything that we do here, we do legally through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they did not have a permit to actually do work with eagle eggs and eagle bodies and things like that. So uh, just a couple weeks ago, they did get their official permit for through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do analysis of the egg. And basically, uh, pretty simply put, uh, egg on opening, there was no development of anything inside of the egg. So basically, we had unfertilized egg. So. There you go. That's the story. Nothing happened during development that caused the eaglet to, to not develop. Uh, just uh, never never started. So uh, we had an unfertilized egg. So time will tell whether we have any more of those. Uh, I guess we got more, more seasons and years coming up here. So anyway, 
that's the story on the egg. I have a quick question for you. So if you had a five gallon, say, pure river falcon gravel pail up there, and you were taking the stuff, the weeds and the dirt and everything, and putting them into the five gallon pail, would it have filled the pail? Would you have needed another pail? Would it be halfway full? In that immediate area, it would have at least filled the pail. Okay. What I moved aside from the weeds and then that second, I didn't pull it all out, but when I was digging through there and sifting through it, it was deep enough and big enough area that it would have probably pretty closely filled up the five gallon pail. So I was talking about the size of the nest and John just gave us another metaphor. The stuff in the nest could have filled a five gallon pail. That's pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, not the whole nest. Um, so, um, and it's always deceiving. We look at this camera and we see the, the bald eagles in there and without a person in there or something to give a good reference, I think we always continue to forget and migrate down to thinking that this is a small thing, but these are very large raptors. Um, and uh, that nest is not nine foot in diameter, but it's... Uh, it's not too shabby. It's got to be, it's it's expanding in size here. And we have been collecting our day-by-day -day foot footage photos from the fixed camera. And I know Amy's been downloading those and we'll probably have another time-lapse shot of the building of the nest uh, this year to add on to what we had from last year. So with that, I think uh, we are ready to go into uh, Q&A after one last thing here. I was going to show you, I've been doing some testing. And we're working on this nest uh, for or the, uh, the visitor center camera. So um, here's what we got. We've got probably the, the best zoom camera that we've ever purchased. So this is a 40x mechanical zoom. Uh, the best that we've had was the Great Spirit Bluff camera and the camera that is still at Decor North, which is a Samsung dome camera, is a 32 mechanical. Uh, times 32x zoom camera. This is a 40x zoom camera, and it's what we call a robot camera. Um, it's not enclosed, so the camera's not enclosed in a dome. I'm just going to show you guys that quick. I'm going to be working with Ryan. It actually looks kind of like a robot. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing looking. And it would be painted, so it's not going to look quite so stark contrast, but uh, so that's what it kind of looks like here. And again, if you've been to Decorah, this will be on the pavilion. So this won't be anywhere near the eagle's nest. But like John said, it will be painted. So it rotates here and then up and down. And it does actually have a mouth. you got to feed it. No, that's a windshield wiper there. Um, so this is the camera that is planned to go at the visitor center. And this is going to give us some shots of the eagles up on the bluff when they're perched up there. Uh, hopefully it'll give us some shots of mom and dad doing some fishing in the retention pond. Uh -huh. At least I think from what I can tell for at least a year or two until the trees in the front grow up. Um, in front of it, we should be able to see them up on the maple tree uh, perch also. So this is the next install project here in the next uh, month. We're really looking forward to seeing it and having them a chance, having a chance to watch them when they're off their nest. Um, we've been talking a little bit with a uh, guy from Boulder County Audubon, Dana Bove, and one of the things they're really interested in studying is the behavior of eagles in what's been called the off-season. So we know now they don't have the simple behavior where they're here, where on the nest, and somewhere else when they're not. So they want to take a little bit uh, deeper look into their lives, as we're doing here and in Decorah North and at, Freight, at, Great, at uh, excuse me, Port St. Brain. Um, they want to take a little bit deeper look into their lives outside of the nesting period. So this is one of the ways that we can do that. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, thank you for your support. I mean, basically the, the donations that uh, people make to Raptor Resource Project is what helps pay for these camera upgrades and things that we've been doing and taking things beyond, you know, where they used to be and, and, uh, the sky's the limit. Um, Great Spirit Bluff, you know, I've been talking, uh, with folks uh, locally there about the possibility of putting a uh, refuge cam out uh, on Lake on Alaska. It's the, the wildlife refuge that's out there to show up close to uh, uh, eagles and um, pelicans and tundra swans and other things off season with the falcons and even through the season. So 
Um, there's some other neat opportunities coming up here to, to uh, help us get even better understanding and views and amazing footage of the, of the birds up and down the Mississippi Wildlife Corridor there. So, um, with that, I think I've covered my agenda and we're to Q&A session here. So here's what I'm going to try. Uh, I have my trusty phone out here. I'm on our Ustream channel. Um, so I'm going to be looking for questions. Moderators, if there's something I can do to make it easier for you or something we can do to make it easier for you, let us know. And if you need to pause the room or slow it down, that's absolutely fine. So we'll see if this works. Uh, if somebody has a question, uh, I'm watching right now. Hopefully this will work. Go ahead and ask it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll put that out right now. Um, ask. Guys coming on the stream. Away. Yes, they are. Looking for questions. Moderators, if there's something I can do to make it easier for you or something. They're just doing that now. Thank you very much. And we got a little bit of a delay here, so we're just going to wait to see if anything comes through on the chat. Okay, that shows up. And while we're waiting, I just want to thank everybody again for being here today. Uh, back at the first after the fledge party, you know, Bob was completely amazed at the number of people that showed up, and he said, People say technology divides us, but look, this is something that brought us all together, and that's really. Um, how we feel about today. It's how, actually, I felt really about the whole week. So just thank you for being here. Okay. We have questions about... <laughs> okay. We'll ask the egg question first. So we have questions about the egg. So, John, you want to recap what you said about the egg? Okay. Um, basically, the egg uh, um, was, was opened up, and there was nothing else in there except for yolk and fluids. And it was smelly, we heard. So... Um, no developing embryo, nothing even close to that, and uh, nothing even close to an eaglet that was even in development. So um, our, our synopsis of what happened then was that the egg was not fertilized. So uh, we had an unfertilized egg, and uh, I guess that's the first that's ever happened that we know of with this, this pair of eagles. Um, Ruby Red, you asked, how can we be sure if my donation will go to the Decora Eagles? Um, we can set that up. We haven't tended to do earmarked giving in the past. People will sometimes make a specific request. So when you make your donation, if you want it to go to something specific, make sure that you specify that at the time. And that's something that we can accommodate. That's not a problem. So, so if you're doing it by PayPal, you can mention it in the comments. Uh, we might have something more formal than that in the future. Um, if it's a donation by mail, you can just write it in the notes part of the check or put a message in with the, with the, with the check. So. Sunny Blue asked, Amy, what were you doing at Fort St. Vrain? I was helping to install a new Fort St. Vrain camera. It is a really interesting wireless and solar power system. Um, there were some unexpected complications, but we all rose to the challenge. And i got to thank XL Energy, especially Bill Heston, and Pat Donahue for all of the help that they gave. It was absolutely invaluable. We got the job done, and it was really quite fun. So um, that's what I was doing. And then, John, we had the question of, what else did you find in the nest? So what else when you were digging for the egg? You mentioned a weed. So we got, had weeds. Uh, we did find uh, some, some prey remains, some small bones. Um, I think uh, we set aside a couple things here. have a, a small, looks like a mammal skull. So I'm going to carry this a little closer so everyone can see it. So John said this is a small mammal skull. I think. Do we got a tooth up there in front? Yep, there's a tooth. I'm going to guess like it's, a it's a squirrel. If you guys can, I don't know if you can see this or not, if you can see yeah. this tooth. See it. Um, so we think probably a squirrel. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, it looked like a garden up there. It looked like really nice potting soil. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I think, you know, as far as prey remains and things like that, there was some there was some remnants of feathers. Remember, we had some 
I think some ducks and was it a possible crow or something? Yeah, something. yeah. Um, but there were some feather remains, uh, the bone remains, I think that was the most intact uh, uh, skeletal part, that, that full skull there. Um, that was about it, other than the egg and, and some a lot of green growing plants and that one really large weed. Somebody wondered if you had found any pellets. Pellets in there. You know, I, I didn't necessarily notice it, but I wasn't actually looking for them either, so um, there very well could have been, but uh, I just wasn't paying attention to that kind of thing. They also break down, at least if they're anything like uh, peregrine falcon, you know, you find the little, yeah. I don't know, pellets is the right word for them, with uh, falcons, but you find That's them in there, right. they, yeah, they, they break up pretty fast. They're um, susceptible to water and everything else, so they break up pretty quickly. I see a, a question here. What will be the abbreviation for the new hatchery cam? I guess that would be the visitor center cam. Um, boy, we'll have to think about that, whether it's going to be the, um, we got N1, we got N2 tree, we got N2B, and we could have VC, visitor center. I don't, I don't know. I think Sherry Elliott suggested something like B2D2. <laughs> Oh, how it looks. There we go, yeah. That would certainly be fitting. B2D2, yeah, I like that. Well, I'm going to take that into consideration. Uh, a permit is needed when you do anything to and with the eagles in their nest. So, first of all, a caveat, I am not an expert on permits. We work closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service and we have permits, but I, I don't want to pretend that I know all about permitting in every situation. It's my understanding, and this is how we operate. First of all, we have a scientific collecting permit, so we cannot take anything out of the nest, uh, not eagle parts, not eagle feathers, or anything else without that scientific collecting permit. So we have that. Um, as far as going into the nest, when we went up to get the uh, body of DN2, for example, we had to ha be permitted for that by the state and also by the Fed. So we needed to make sure that we had all of our permits for that. Um, on the question of cameras in an active nest, I've heard a couple of different things about that. Um, I'm actually kind of uncomfortable asking that question, so I'm just going to say that yes, when you work with eagles in their nest, you need to have permits, and you usually need to have state and federal permits, not just one. And you probably need to have a variety of permits. Uh, certainly we do. Yeah. So here's another one. What will the next egg be called? So I think... Uh, we really don't uh, call them anything until they hatch, right? Yeah, that so is D true. D26? Yep, that would be D26. So, um, and that takes out that whole thing. Uh, you know, if we don't wait until something actually emerges from the egg, then it really kind of filters out the unhatched eggs and things like that, which we actually had for the first time last year. So, good question. And John, there's a question by Nuthatches1. You know more about this subject than I do. It's great hearing the comeback of our raptor population. Do you know of any land preservation efforts? So I know, mm -hmm. you know, there are preservation groups along the river. So if you want to talk about yeah. that. Yeah, so uh, there's specific uh, groups um, in, Min in Minnesota with the property that, that I grew up on there, Great Spirit Bluff, and a good chunk of the next bluff areas over to the north and south have been conserved. So... Uh, a big mansion or house would be built out on the end or would be commercialized or whatever through the Minnesota Land Trust. The Wisconsin side, there's the Wisconsin Land Trust and the one that's in the La Crosse, Wisconsin area there is called the uh, Mississippi Valley Conservancy. And so those land trust organizations uh, work with landowners and businesses and developers to do planned uh, uh, designations of, of areas and it is actually a thing that's of value so uh, monies that are donated from philanthropic organizations I think McKnight Foundation and that's just one that I remember that comes to name have and other foundations have donated large chunks of money in uh, the Blufflands corridor is actually uh, a preservation project and program where specific pieces of property like bluffs or other things that might come up for sale or uh, you know a transition in a family ownership or something like that or if someone wants to just preserve land the trust will actually donate some money towards the value of that land and then um, in the in the u.s uh, laws right now 
tax code a certain portion of that appraised value of land if there is a reduction in the value that could be developed and things like that um, that is considered up to a certain point a, a tax uh, deductible donation on taxes so if you've got taxable income you can take advantage of things like that so there's a number of different ways that these land land trusts and land preservation organizations will help preserve uh, either unique land at risk land or land that's got uh, very special habitat or species uh, that's important if if someone's interested in getting involved in a program like that is there anything they can google sure. look for sure. people they can contact yeah there, there's a there's a national association of land trusts um, locally there it's the Mississippi, uh, uh, Mississippi Valley Conservancy uh, right in the La Crosse area, in the Driftless area there, there's a couple others. Um, but I think uh, just look for Wisconsin and land trusts, and probably almost every land trust in Wisconsin would come up, and then probably other states too. Um, uh, Minnesota uh, land trust uh, also. Okay, and then we have a question about how the Philippine Eagle Project is going. I know you addressed that earlier, yeah, I just want to give yeah. a quick recap. Yeah, so uh, remember that was uh, we wanted to try to check and see what the, the viability of putting a jungle Philippine Eagle cam would be. Um, and so we did fundraising last year for the fundraising event at the Celtic Junction. We were very successful. I think uh, even, even a number of donations from Giving Tuesday last year were earmarked for possible Philippine Eagle use uh, by the people who donated. So um, so we did raise the money. Uh, we split costs. Uh, we did a project with Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So they funded 50% of the project. We funded 50% of the project. We sent three people, uh, Neil Reddick, uh, Kike Arnold, and Charles Eldemeyer uh, out over to the Philippines. They did numerous climbs. They met with uh, indigenous people there. The Philippine Eagle uh, Foundation, Dennis uh, and his crew over in the Philippines, and they actually went out and did scouts. So it was we call it the Philippine Eagle Scout. Um, so number of nests were identified where we could put a camera. Uh, we were looking at what would need to be done to put something and successfully put it into place. And as I mentioned earlier in the day, a couple of things came up. One is the technology. So we, we do have, you know, if we're going to do this, we have to have a way to get the video from the camera to the internet so we can show it to people. So that's one of the challenges presently. The meetings that happened with the cellular companies there, which uh, we were going to go through a cellular router. Um, the bandwidth and just the commitment that we were able to get from those companies was not enough that would um, be cost effective or to even technically give us the kind of bandwidth that we would need to, to bring a, a good 24 7 uh, feed out to the public through the internet. So, um, so connectivity was an issue. The other thing that's a challenge with the Philippine Eagle is they don't lay eggs uh, and have young every year. Is it every two to three years or two to yeah, four it's years? Yeah, um, it's every, I think it would be every third year because it takes yeah. the, the total period and that's just wrong. I don't years. know that for uh, uh, for sure, but it is, it's yeah. not every year, it's not even every other year. Um, and so that's a challenge too because if we're going to look at potential active sites, we need to fit them with the cameras while the eagles are not active and we need to guess where we think they might uh, pick a nest. And some of the Philippine Eagle pairs have multiple nests in the same area. So we don't even know which one of the nests a certain pair of eagles would uh, would choose to use. So though that was really the result of the scout, which was the purpose of the scout was to see how feasible is this and what would we need to do to make this a reality. So the other part of the component there is how many of these systems could we put up there to make sure that we were going to be successful in capturing at least one or two of them where the eagles would actually nest. So 
we realized that we were going to have to duplicate and probably put maybe three, four systems out there. And when you talk about uh, remote transfer and solar power and putting the cameras out there and doing this all in the Philippines, where almost everything has got a tax on it um, and, and the costs go way up, it just it was not the kind of funds that we saw that we we could uh, um, generate and, and donate efforts through just the Raptor Resource Project. So, um, so not a done deal. It's uh, we did the scout. I think we know the hurdles that we're facing. So, if we found uh, satellite-based internet that worked there, that was cost-effective, that would take one piece of the puzzle uh, and 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 make that part of it work. Okay. The other one would be if we had an organization that was really interested in making this happen um, and we had some funding that would help pay for multiple camera systems to be deployed and maintained there, um, you know, then you know, those two things are the things that I think that we need to solve before we could be actively do something. By all means, it's not, um, you know, not going to happen in any way. The other thing we really sat down as a group and we talked about, especially with Neil and Laura, is the feedback that they uh, talked and, and were getting from the Philippine Eagle Foundation as to what are their needs and what can we do to help them most. And there are some amazing films that are going to be coming out here in the next year that are actually, they're the filming footage that Neil and Laura and the crews did when they were over there for over a year. So uh, there's some amazing films that are going to come out in the next year. Um, we wanted to talk to the Philippine Eagle Foundation, uh, to Dennis and crew, and, and just find out, you know, right now, what's the best way that we can help uh, the Philippine Eagle and the Philippine Eagle Foundation do its mission. So that's where we're at right now is we need to get connected with the foundation and and have that discussion with them. So, And I will try to remember to follow up. They're doing a program right now called Forest Guardians. It's absolutely fascinating. It was, if I remember that correctly, is. the brainchild of Jason Ivanet. So I'll see if I can get some material about that to post, post on Facebook um, and our website. And real quick, we had a question about D25. Now, as you guys will recall, and I'm sorry for anyone who didn't know this, D25 was struck by a car and killed. So D24 is still alive and healthy and doing well. But D25 was pretty sure, struck by a vehicle at any rate, right. Phil. So his body went to uh, Madison Wildlife Health Center, I believe, yes. for autopsy, but we haven't heard anything back. Uh, when and if we hear something back, we will certainly let you know. We also had a question about whether or not we did any education with people around uh, the issue of DN2's death and poisoning. And first of all, yes, we did immediately. Um, again, we don't know where that came from, but we just sort of talked to everybody in the area about it. Right. Uh, because it seemed like a better thing to do than just, you know, try to find out who did it. That's not a possible thing to find out, but it is possible to make everybody aware of it, and they were very receptive to the message. Um, beyond that, John talked about this a little bit earlier. We're looking at doing a technical uh, paper with somebody that will get into journals. It's not as exciting as putting it on the Internet, but that's actually an extremely doing that research, research proving it, and letting people know about it who are in wildlife health, in the Fish uh, and Wildlife Service, and in organizations like the Peregrine Fund and organi other organizations like us is really a simple part of addressing the problem. So we're also moving in that direction as well. Um, we did a couple blogs on it. I can also put together some stuff on our website for it, but that's sort of where we went with that. It is an issue that's been uh, watched by, by the Midwest states, uh, and uh, it's an off-target, off-label use of an insecticide, so it is a, you know, officially it's an illegal use of a pesticide. And, uh, you know, those, those get reported to EPA and to the uh, state uh, Department of Natural Resources uh, uh, groups in, in the respective states. So, so we've done our duty in getting that reported and, uh, and uh, I guess getting the word out to the people who could be using that is the best that we can do right now. So thank you for that question. And we are now ready for more questions, so if you have any more, um, you can ask away. Thank you, Priscilla Ash. <laughs> Thank you for all you do. Thank you to all of our moderators and volunteers for all they do. I, we couldn't do it without you. 
while we're waiting here, I'm just going to mention um, uh, certainly would be like like to be further along in just some of the things that we can offer to people that love the Decor Eagles or love Raptors in general. Um, we're working on some t-shirt designs. I just want to let you guys know that we are doing something. Um, now we've got some things that we've done that are fun, you know, just kind of getting into doing some neat stuff like Decor Eagle playing cards. Yeah, lock those um, over. And, um, you know, we've got, we've got some neat posters that we will make available uh, for the February February 18th, again, mark yep. your calendars if you're in the Midwest area, if you're interested, or we'll probably have an online silent auction and something of that sort again. We'll have some great uh, uh, bands. The Brian Baru Pipe Band, uh, Mr. Dingley told me, is going to, uh, in fact, after the, after the last one, they're like, when can we do this again? So um, we said, we'll be ready for you in a year. Um, so we're going to have a fundraiser coming up in February at the Celtic Junction, uh, and uh, we'll come up with some of the, you know, what are we doing the fundraiser for? We'll be coming up with that, but you can imagine it's going to be something that's on our mission statement here. Um, we still have, and I give these out, you know, and we have these available. You can get them yourself too. American Eagle uh, and Raptor Force, just two of the movies that Neil Reddick and, and Bob Anderson did together, along with others, um, Rob McIntyre and other board members. Uh, uh, so, we have a question for you, John. Did you see Mom or Dad in the area while you were on the nest? I don't believe we did. Um, if I remember right, the day that I went up in the nest was right after a pretty major rainfall. This is like the second oh, that's right. very high rainfall in the area, and um, this will tell you how much rain we got. Um, the, the flooding that happened in Decorah was, I think, about three weeks to maybe a month prior to that. And then um, as I was driving up to get some camera equipment that night, uh, after that, uh, um, I came through some areas uh, in southern Minnesota and in Iowa that you had to go through a foot of water or more flooding coming through. But um, the next day, the, the, the water had risen high enough that we weren't even sure that we were going to be able to climb back up and finish and to be until the waters receded. So it was coming up that high. Um, I don't remember seeing either mom or dad that day that we were up there. We did leave. The traditional trout uh, <laughs> in both N1 and N2 uh, B, and I thought for sure that this year they sat there. We watched the flies on them. We watched a couple generations of flies go through their life cycle, <laughs> and it didn't look like there was much left of those trout there. But when mom, I still remember the morning because uh, you know you can imagine how it goes when you're the director of the Raptor Resource Project, and, and you know you. You're going on these these famous eagles, and it's like, hey, we haven't seen those eagles in that nest yet. And it's like, it's later than it was last year, but we had this really strange warm weather this year. But I specifically remember that day where mom showed up in the nest and uh, and, and dad, and and she she ate the 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 trout jerky. Um, it had been perforated, and it had been worked, and it had been. Uh, there's probably only half of it there, but she found it and she ate it. So, um, not the day that we were up there, but uh, it took a little while for them to get there. And I think something with the weather and the warmer weather just kind of changed a little bit of their habits. They, they didn't get into the nest near as, as early as they did in 2015. We have uh, two questions about eagle tracking. One, can we update the maps more? And two, how many eagles are we tracking? So. Basically, we update the maps when we get the data. Uh, sometimes transmitters talk to us. Sometimes right. the weather gets it's cold It's based on, on the sunlight because the, the, the transmitter downloads data based on, on the battery. So if we've got a lot of gray overcast days, it takes longer for the battery to get recharged to the point that it can actually transmit the data to the satellite and be picked up. So um, that's what we continually hear from Brad is that, you know, Hope for some sunny days if we're waiting. Um, yeah, uh, if we haven't seen data for a while, we're waiting for sunny days. But that's that's the way it goes. I mean, 
when we don't get data, we don't know what that means, whether the transmitter is, you know, the transmitter yeah. should still be transmitting as long as it gets sunlight. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's not turned upside down, not getting anything or whatever. So that's what we hear is we're, we're going to report it as soon as we get it. And sometimes we don't get it because it hasn't been bright enough out. We're going into those winter months now where the, the number of hours of light in the day are less. So. And then we also got asked how many eagles we're tracking right now. So right now we're just tracking D24. And it's sort of, so Brett Mandernack has a study. It's an absolutely enormous longitudinal multi-year study of free living bald eagles in the Midwest. And then his eagles also go up into Canada. So our eagles are actually part of his study. And one of the things he really likes about our eagles is that he knows where they come from. So that adds really kind of an extra dimension of richness to thinking about the eagles and how they live. Um, so we've got one enrolled. Now, if you go to our website, raptorresource.org, click Explore. It's up in the top bar. And go to the drop down and click Eagle Maps. You can come across our interactive email maps, our, our interactive email Eagle Maps, and also all of Brett's PDFs. So you can take a look not only at the one eagle we're tracking now, D24, but also D25, 4, D14, and even back to D1. So there's really a lot of data out there if you're interested in sort of exploring where the eagles have been, uh, in addition to where they are now. I think recently D24 has been in the prairie machine. Wisconsin area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty no. close to Eagle Valley, right by Brett. So. Yeah, yeah. So, and what we're hoping, you know, obviously we have a lot going on. Hopefully, one of the two of us, or both of us, or Brett, or somebody can take a break and go out and track D24. Because that's something, you know, I miss having those reports from Bob. Those are just, they were really great. So, we'll be doing some of that in early, early 20s. We sure hope so. <laughs> Road trip. <laughs> Road trip. So, uh, if there are any other questions, I'm looking real quick. Oh, so D1 is. Uh, so DN1 is out there somewhere as a sole survivor, yes. Presumably we don't know, once they leave the nest, we don't know anything about them. We can't identify them again. So um, certainly I would like to think so. Uh, let's see. All right, I don't see any other questions right now. We can maybe, maybe five more minutes? I don't um. think, ten more minutes? I'm ready to get back to work. Okay, all right. Okay, then um, we'll take, I think, two more questions. Uh, Ruby Red just asked John and Amy, how can we as chatters help you be so successful, more successful? That is a really nice question, and I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, obviously donations help. I hate to give that answer because it sounds, you know, like kind of greedy or whatever, but you can't run an organization without money, so that is helpful. Um, beyond that, that's actually a really interesting question, and I want to think about that some, because some of the things I've been thinking about are, you know, who's really watching us, how can we help you, how can we deal with the proliferation of devices and technologies uh, and things people want to do. So that's actually something I'm thinking about, and maybe a question that you can help us answer. So. Uh, I appreciate that question. I will. I, that's something that I will be thinking about. So thank you. Yeah, I think it helps. You know, if you guys, uh, you know, say we really like to hear about this technology or what's happening with uh, this type of raptor, or whether it be eagle or falcon specific or another raptor, we'd like to hear more about it with a blog or um, you know something focused like that. I think. Uh, you guys let us know what it is that you want. I know that everybody likes to see the videos posted. People like to see good close-ups, good detail of, of the, the raptors. So, uh, you know, what we can give you to, to make your experience better, I guess, uh, uh, that's going to help us yeah. better to, to give you guys what you want. And John, I'm going to give you your last question, but I'll take mine. And the question was from Chico70. When will GSB be back up? Okay. We'll be active again. Okay. So um, the camera has been on. We've got a, a Canon camera that's out on the second uh, point there that looks at the nest box. And, and it just, uh, we're in cam training mode and learning this that new camera system. So that camera's on. The nest box camera is installed and the, 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 the signal and the feed are coming in. Um, I can broadcast to the nest box anytime that we want to. It's just there's really nothing in the nest box this time of year. So I can go look at the camera and, and look at it and check and verify that everything is, is working well with it. So uh, not much of a need to broadcast that one right now. Um, 
come mid to late February, we'll be looking at that one a little bit more. Uh, we might actually have two camera feeds for Great Spirit Bluff this year. Uh, we're talking about uh, having the Nest Box camera be its own stream and then having the, the remote camera be its own stream. Um, and I, I think there's, it's nice. The one nice thing about that is it really makes and frees up the, the, the video for the videographers. So uh, it's nice to be able to see picture in picture, and that was really cool technology. And you can still always do that. Um, but it's nice also to have you know, one stream that's just the Nest Box camera. So if somebody who wants to see the Nest Box all the time can see it. And then if somebody wants to see barges or river activity or if they want to see what's going on out in the wildlife refuge or uh, you know snow or weather or things like that, then they can watch that, that camera. So I think that's what we're going to be doing this year. Is I know on the explore side there will be two cameras and we'll have the same thing duplicated on Ustream also. So um, it's live right now. The one camera, the Nest Box camera, is not being broadcasted, so we'll start that up. We could do that just about any time. Yeah. Um, and then Explorer will be opening up a second uh, um, site for that. I think the way theirs are displayed is they can fit them both onto the same landing page because they're using a YouTube platform. Um, so they can have one cam, and then you can see the other cam, and you just click on it, and it just swaps them. Some of them, they have three or four cameras. I think three I've seen at least. Um, so it'll probably be on the same page, but with the choice of which camera you want to see on the Explore platform. And then for what we've got going to Ustream, it'll actually probably be two separate pages. Yeah. And one of the things you can do if you're waiting for them to come back is listen for them. So for in addition to watching them, if you don't see them because they're off camera, in late February, early March, listen for what is it? Because yeah. Michelle or whatever female comes back will be wailing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they and, time uh, of the year. <laughs> yeah, we've we've got. Uh, um, it seemed like they came back a little bit late last year, but I remember I was down here training, doing some training with Joni Foreman here with the new controls here at Command Central, and I was showing her how we could go look at some of the other cameras. And we were looking it up. All of a sudden, we saw some falcons diving across the bluff. And I said, hey, it looks like the falcons are back. And then we started That's watching nice. it. And I actually captured that video of them flying around that day. It was pretty amazing. Falcons are just amazing acrobatic flyers. It's just really cool to watch them. Unfortunately, with cameras, you know, once you zoom out far enough that you can see them flying around, they're so small you can't that really you really see don't see much. So you almost got to be there in person. Unfortunately, I can tell you that. Just uh, um, keep you, uh, you, know, you guessing about wanting to be there in person. So my last question was why we didn't get DN3 out of the nest. As anyone who watches the North Nest knows, DN3 experienced significant sibling aggression that was undoubtedly part of the factors that led to its death. So DN3 died. I uh, experienced sibling aggression, it didn't get enough food, and the parents didn't seem to be brooding it as much as it needed given its age. It was six days younger than the oldest one. Then DN2 died, and we went up to the nest and we got it out, and it was a big deal. So there were a really important difference between those two deaths, and that's that, well, DN3 was, it was a sad death, don't get me wrong about that, but it was natural. It's part of what goes on in an eagle's world. We haven't seen it in Decora, uh, but we do know what happens in other nests, and it did happen in, in D, uh, Decora North. So that was not something that we wanted to interfere with. Every time we go up to the nest, and this is a hard nest to get into, we're putting other eaglets at risk, uh, we're putting eagles at risk in the active season, and again this was a natural thing. If we'd gone to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to try to get a permit for this because we're going into an active nest, which permits are required for, uh, they would never have issued it and they would have been right not to issue it. It's hard to watch, but it's natural. If you contrast that to DN2, we saw mom fly some food in, uh, we saw Dan to eat it and get sick and die. We saw mom get very sick and flap around the nest. To me, that was actually the most upsetting thing to watch, and that was one of the reasons we turned this. It was just too upsetting. Um, so when we called our federal partners and said, hey, something went really wrong, and here's the video, and here's the documentation, and we have to do something, they agreed for a couple of reasons. First of all, when something goes wrong in a nest, they really do want to know 
an eagle getting picked on and died is sad, but normal. An eagle suddenly eating food and falling over dead is not normal. So they want to know what went on. They wanted us to get the carcass for autopsy. And then also they didn't want, because eagles have a habit of tearing apart dead young and feeding them to live young, they didn't want the last eagle in the nest to be killed uh, by the parent feeding it part of the dead young. So it's sad, and I understand why we get that question, but that is why we didn't go get DN3 natural versus why we went and got DN2 unnatural. So um, I hope that's something that you can understand. It's, I think we've really been uh, graced by the, sort of how nice things are on the Decora nest. Um, that's wonderful, and I enjoy watching it, but it's not the same in all nests. So. Right. And that's the value of having uh, a contrasting camera that is not located right next to a fish hatchery. Um, so it, it's more real world, most likely. Um, uh, this is a very uh, advantageous, uh, um, great spot for eagle to be right where trout are being raised and hatched. And, and there's a discharge pond that has uh, lots of trout. Uh -huh. um, and then there's the, the trout that are native here and the suckers and, and abundant uh, source of food around here in the city area, even around here, um, probably not, I don't know, maybe not as much competition. Um, yeah, that's and, true too. And more food yeah. being offset with, with the hatchery right here. So um, very interesting and neat to be able to compare the two. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Yeah. This has been such a fun day. I thanks, special thanks to our moderators um, for being here with us, for accommodating us today and for, uh, for doing this Q&A session, so thanks. Um, and just thanks for being here, and <laughs> I hate to say it, but I'm gonna say it anyway, please consider making a donation to the Raptor Research Project for Giving Tuesday. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks so much to Lori Carnes and, and her second grade class earlier today. That was so much fun. Um, and the other teachers out there, there's probably over a thousand uh, out there that we know that are tying in some way to this. So. Uh, let us know how we can help develop our upcoming uh, initiative to make materials that are going to work for you.